This is one of the pictures I took at CPAC this year when uh, President Trump was arriving. It was very nice of him to fly in right outside my hotel room. So I got those. His entourage was about 20 vehicles. Took two helicopters, 20 vehicles. The last in the, in the group is a huge MICU. CPAC was fun. I wish we had gotten better results from it, but we got what we got. So who am I? I have been a member of the Constitution Party for about 10 years now, and my first meeting was the one in Newark. And I'm one of those people who, as soon as I found out that there was a Constitution Party, joined it. There are a lot more people like me out there. We just have to find them. I've been a financial advisor, personal financial advisor, for 38 years. This is my newsletter, Wealth Creation and Preservation. If you would like a free subscription to my newsletter, you are welcome to receive it. Just legibly print on a piece of paper your name and your email address and what you would like, and I will be happy to add you to the list. Uh, it's, it's free. This issue, which is my first quarter 2018 issue, was a particularly interesting one. This is a story that nobody has picked up on. If you're old enough to remember Khrushchev's speech at the Polish Embassy in Moscow in 1956, he talked about how he, was, he and the Soviet Union were going to bury us and the free world. And this story is about how they may be about to accomplish that. You might want to get a hold of that issue and find out. It's nothing that the news, the news media have picked up yet. They will, but not yet. Okay. It was mentioned a few minutes ago about the Citizens United decision and somebody's efforts to repeal it. You might want to read this before you get involved in that because this is uh, some facts and falsehoods about the Citizens United decision, which I didn't know. I've been speaking in favor of the decision itself and repealing the Johnson Amendment. And this changed my thinking quite a bit. So again, if you would like a copy of this, let me know. Put it on a piece of paper, your email address, and so on, and I will send it to you. All right, now we're at the topic of the presentation, which is God and country. And I was recently told when I attempted to give this presentation in Maryland that uh, it would be unusual to be allowed to give a presentation with that kind of a title. We've fallen that far as a nation. So in the next few minutes, I will share my thoughts about rescuing our constitutional republic. Also, if you'd like a copy of these slides, I'll be happy to send that to you. I will discuss the basic tenets of progressivism and show why it is so terribly dangerous. I will discuss whether we were once a Christian nation and what we are today. I will discuss some of the things that all Americans can do to preserve our freedoms. And finally, I will establish a link, or I will attempt to establish a link between the Christian religion and the Constitution. So, what is the Constitution Party? Here is how I understand the Constitution Party. The Constitution Party is the only group of people in America with the objective and the political authority to restore our Constitution and save our Republic. Is that it? I think it is. I think that's pretty close. In other words, if we don't save our country, nobody else is going to do it. Wow, that puts a bit of a burden on us, doesn't it? All right. So why are we here? Well, first of all, we love our country. We love and respect our Constitution. We wish for all Americans to enjoy and appreciate the blessings of freedom. We want to defend our constitutional republic. And I just, one of the words that I have tried to eliminate from my vocabulary is democracy. Our last 30 presidents have failed to read their job description. All of our members of Congress have failed to read their job description. Most of the media have failed to read what the Constitution is all about. They have no idea. Everybody thinks that this is a democracy. Never has been, never will be, couldn't possibly be, for lots of reasons that I'm not going to get into today. We have a constitutional republic, and that's very, very important to distinguish. And we want to help create the nation the founders envisioned. Now, spoiler alert, we have never created or enabled the founders' vision. Will we ever? Doesn't look like it the way we're going right now, but at least we can restore some of the things that we had with at the time of the founding. We can try to at least. But that nation has never been created, and I'm going to explain to you why. So is it possible to save our republic? I believe, this is personal belief, it is still possible, but the task becomes more difficult with each passing day, and I will tell you why. Now, my big thing is lifelong learning. It's absolutely essential. By the time I graduated with my master's degree in business administration, I began to realize that I didn't know anything. I vividly remember Mrs. Boothby, my American history teacher in high school in New York. She absolutely adored Eleanor Roosevelt. So we learned a lot about the United Nations. We learned a lot about human rights. 
and hardly anything about the founding of this country, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. That was basically two to two and a half generations ago. It's gotten much worse since then. Okay. As a nation, we are increasingly confused about terms like democracy, socialism, justice, racism, so on and so forth. And there is little or no public debate at any level on the issues that face us. I recently took a college course on historical methods to improve my, and to update my research methods for my writing. And uh, the topic was World War I, and I focused on Woodrow Wilson. And long before he was elected president, Woodrow Wilson had written a book saying that the United States Constitution is badly set up. We need to make changes. We need to make it more like Britain's parliament. That sounds like Ginsburg, where we ought to emulate the Egyptian constitution rather than ours. Do you really, are you really worthy to accept that job if you're going to believe that somebody else has a better system than we do? By the way, who has the oldest established government in the world in continuous operation? Anybody know? Nope. Nope. The Isle of Man. You've listened to me before. The Isle of Man. It's an island in the Irish Sea between Ireland and England. I've been there twice. Fabulous place. What did they do that has enabled them to keep their parliament going for almost 1,000 years? They did something very simple. Every year, they invite the entire citizenry of the Isle of Man to a sacred place called Tinwald. And there they read the entire constitution. Every year to anybody who wants to show and thousands of people show up. A little tiny island, thousands of people show up for this thing. It is, it's a tradition. One of the things we have let slip in this country. Okay, read every day. We've got to do it, we all have to do it. When I joined the party, again, as, like I said, I realized I knew nothing about the Constitution. I had been a political science major way back in college. That was before the Army, that was a long time ago. Things had changed. And I knew that I wanted to know as much as I could possibly know to be of use in serving this party. So I began reading. And having now read, oh, about 150 books, and having put together my reading list, which highlights about the best 80 of them, I learned a little bit. The most important thing I have learned, though, that I really wanted to learn was the real intent of the Founding Fathers. What was it they wanted to, to accomplish, to create? Were they indeed divinely inspired? I believe they were. And how did that inspiration work, and how is it shown forth in their writings and so on? We have to do this. I don't care how long you've been a member of the party, there's a lot more to learn, especially keeping up. I don't read newspapers. I just, there's no point to it. I don't listen to Rush or Sean or Glenn or anybody like that. Those are paid entertainers. I get my information out of books because a book is written with a lot of background, a lot of history. So you are brought up to speed on that particular principle, idea, thought, point, whatever it is, knowing everything that went before. That's really, really important. And that's what our children are not getting. So it's not enough to be familiar with the issues of the day. We have to be thoroughly educated in the principles of freedom. We have to live, it is incumbent upon us to live as self-governing citizens. And we can take an active part in restoring America by ensuring that our children and our grandchildren receive a good education, which is almost impossible, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So, recommended reading. This is the book that really got me started. When I joined the party, I talked to Howard Phillips. I was privileged to get to know him a little bit before he passed away. And he asked me, well, what are you going to do to help promote the work of the party? And I said, I don't know. I've got a career. I've got a family. I've got things to do. I just, I'm here to see what, uh, what's going on. And he said, well, that's not a very good answer. He was right. So I wrote my first book, The Patriot's Guide to Taking America Back, which was my response to all the books that I call problem books. And you'll see that on your reading list. A lot of books are problem books. People write them. They make an awful lot of money with them. Uh, Glenn Beck writes them, uh, Mark Levin writes them, so on and so forth, these books on various topics about what's wrong with America. You read through the first 250 pages, and then you get to the last six pages, and that's, here's how to fix it. And none of those things that you have to do to fix it have any political traction whatsoever. They're not going to happen. So what good is reading a book like that? Well, it may help to identify the issues. I determined that if I was going to write about the Constitution, my books were going to be solution books. So the Patriot's Guide to Taking America Back, 60% of the book has my perception of the problems that we face, again, based upon all the background and the history that I knew at that time. But the last portion of it is my training guide for the Constitution Party to help you to organize your local units all over your state, your county, whatever it happens to be. Ideas about getting people to accept assignments, uh, soliciting contributions, um, 
recruiting new members, so on and so forth. This is a solution book. Okay. But we then, after I had written Patriot's Guide, I ran across this book. This book was by Matthew Spaulding, who at the time worked for the Heritage Foundation and is the primary editor of the Heritage Foundation Guide to the Constitution as well. Um, has nine wonderful chapters on the Constitution itself, but chapter 10 is worth the price of admission. Chapter 10 is his chapter on progressivism. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from that chapter. I was so impressed with this book that I went to Washington, set up an appointment with Matthew Spaulding, and sat down with him and talked about what the Heritage Foundation was going to do and what I could do and what he was going to do. And he said, well, the Heritage Foundation is basically a lobbying organization. We are never going to be politically active in any other respect besides our lobbying efforts, so everything else is up to you. Matthew Spaulding has since moved over to Hillsdale College. He works at the Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies, which is the brownstone just really across the street from the Heritage Foundation headquarters in, in, in D.C., about two blocks from the Supreme Court. I met Matthew again at CPAC and encouraged him to expand on Chapter 10. I said, basically, based on the strength of your book, this book, I wrote my second book about the Constitution, Will You Help Save Your Country?, which is about progressivism. But you're a better writer than I am. You're more authoritative. You have a better education in these things. Would you please expand on that? He said, I will think about it. <laughs> Maybe he will. All right. You've all read, everybody's read The 5,000-Year Leap, I hope. It's very good, and it's not dated. It's still timely. Why would I put this book in, The Failure of the Founding Fathers? A couple of reasons. One, it's true. There are several things in which they failed. And in, in fact, the most important way in which I think the Founding Fathers failed is not mentioned in this book. And that has to do with public education. Jefferson wrote about it. Um, Adams wrote about it. Washington wrote about it. Nobody did anything about it. Not that it belongs in the Constitution, but how many of you have been to Monticello and seen Jefferson's tombstone? A few of you. What's missing on the tombstone? President of the United States. What is on the tombstone that he thought was more important? And... Virginia's Law for Religious Liberty. That was his most important accomplishment as far as he was concerned. He also talked about education. He tried to initiate efforts like the University of Virginia, but of course education has to start much earlier than that. And then David Barton, if you haven't read any of his books, this one is outstanding. Then, on your rec going back to this list, I have my top ten list, which of course includes both of my books and Matthew Spaulding's book and a few others, but then I have the eye-openers down here. This one. You need to read Saul Alinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, before you read this one. But then you've got to read this one. This is from David Horowitz. It's a pamphlet. You can read it in 20 minutes. It's very, very important. Why? Because it says something that nobody else has said. That is this. The entire progressive agenda about creating a utopia has no plan. And they have no idea what utopia is going to look like when they create it. All they want to do is to deal with problems, and when necessary, invent problems, so that by solving the problem, they can gain more power. That's it. That's the progressive agenda. That's what it's all about. It's about power. It's about money. It's about control. Read this. Silent Spring at 50. Some of you are old enough to remember Rachel Carson. And that book and all the, the, the help it provided to the environmental movement. It was a tremendous help. Through her efforts, through this book and through her public speeching, speaking, Rachel Carson and others were able to get the use of DDT banned worldwide. Now, Silent Spring at 50 updates Rachel Carson's writing and basically says, first, 50 years later, there is no scientific evidence that any human being has ever been harmed by DDT. Not one. Including those in the South, the United States, where the government would come in and spray the entire interior of the house heavily with DDT. Not one human being was ever harmed by DDT. So what's this all about? Rachel Carson invented the precautionary principle, which you're all familiar with. And the precautionary principle, the progressives absolutely love that. You may have the cure for cancer, but if there's a chance that one in a million would die from the cure, rather than being cure, oh no, we can't do that, it's too dangerous. So why do they allow all those medications to be advertised on TV? This medication may cause death, but that's just a side effect. Don't worry about it. I don't understand that. Now, look at the other side of what Rachel Carson did. 
how many hundreds of millions of people have suffered painful, excruciating deaths because they didn't have access to DDT. There is no substitute. And the fact is that millions and millions of people die every single year because there is no DDT. Thank you, Rachel Carson, for killing millions of people. This is progressivism at its best. All right, the Imperial Cruise. I'm just going to skip through these. I'm going to run out of time very quickly. Um, you thought you knew your American history. This is about the secret mission that uh, Teddy Roosevelt, our first progressive president, sent his Secretary of State, Secretary of War, one of the other, uh, William Howard Taft, future president of the United States, to the East to accomplish. Teddy Roosevelt was a racist. He was a racial supremacist. He believed that the white race was superior to all others, and he was out to prove it. He believed that the the superior race had crossed the small pond, the Atlantic, and had subdued the inferior races of this hemisphere. Now it was time under his direction as President of the United States to move across the big pond. Problem was, across the Pacific, there were not enough white folks to carry that message. So he hired the Japanese to civilize and bring Christianity, so, so to speak, to the benighted peoples of Asia. And so part of the secret mission was to hand over Korea, the nation of Korea, to Japan, which he did. You didn't know that, did you? The other part of the mission was to see how the insurrection was going in the Philippines in the wake of the Spanish-American War. Because the Filipinos didn't like the Americans any more than they liked the Spanish. So it became the policy, sponsored by President Roosevelt, of the United States Army that any Filipino male, 10 years of age or older, was to be shot on sight as a terrorist. And the cover of Life magazine in May of 1903 featured two U.S. Army soldiers waterboarding a Filipino. It's not a new technique. The United States Army waterboarded, I believe the numbers are 160,000 Filipinos, most of them drowned. Racial superiority. Shock Doctrine from Naomi Klein. I've got two books on the list from her. One of them is good, that's this one. The other one is terrible. You need to read them both to compare one with the other. Inconvenient facts. At CPAC, the booth opposite ours, opposite the Constitution Party booth, was taken up by Gregory Whitestone. Whitestone, I had a chance to meet him and talk with him. Read this book. If you read nothing else in the list, please read this book. He's got charts and graphs like you wouldn't believe. There are a couple of them where I'm not entirely sure where he was going. I'm going to talk to him about it. But this book clearly indicates the globe is not warming. It's cooling. We're heading for the next ice age. And he says, we get very close to the point where we had too little carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to sustain life. Fortunately, with the help of the Industrial Revolution, we're boosting those levels somewhat. But if levels fell to where they were below, before the Industrial Revolution, there's a good chance that we would not be able to support half the people who are alive today. Carbon dioxide increases crop yields very significantly. It's very, very important. And by the way, the presence of carbon dioxide and global warming as we have it, as we understand it today, is very beneficial because it doesn't increase severe storms. It decreases them. Read the book. Okay. This is Naomi Klein's other book. This is a screed on President Trump and why he's so terrible, most of which I agree with. But then she goes on to how he has thrown away the world's opportunity to be saved from global warming, yada, 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 all sorts of nonsense. So you read it so you see how far out the, the left has gone. Anyway, let's move on. So why would you read this book? This is called Towards Soviet America. I just finished it recently. Written in 1932 at the height of the Great Depression by William Z. Foster. Why would you read it, a book like this at all? Because it details the communist conspiracy. Here's some quotes. Religion is the sworn enemy of liberty, education, and science. In the USSR, religion is being liquidated. Do we see any of that going on here today? Yeah, I think we do. Is it following the same pattern? No, it's more gentle here. We're just kind of being blinded by all this stuff. It's just happening while we're not watching. Oh, this one. Towards Soviet America. It's on the list. Thank you. All right. Um, William Z. Foster. It's a hard-to-find book, by the way. I think you can get it on Amazon. Thank you. He was. Yes. With private property and industry and land abolished. There's a quote from the book. That's what communism does. That's what socialism does eventually because it all ends up that way. How do we know that in this country, that that's got to happen? Because with the growth of the welfare state, 
more and more taxes have to be imposed upon working people until the government simply has to own all the means of production. We're heading in that direction. We're clearly heading in that direction. So the state is to be replaced with planning boards, the wealthier to have their property seized, and he uses the word liquidated a lot more than I wish he would, but he does. And then citizenship in the Soviet democracy is based upon work. You don't work, you don't vote. Of course, you only have one candidate to vote for anyway, but if you don't work, you don't vote. Okay, moving on. So what form of government will we have? We have two choices. We have a constitutional republic or we have anything else. Literally, those are the only two choices. Either we get back to our constitutional republic or we're going to be like the rest of the world. So if we're like the rest of the world, we will have a totalitarian government masquerading as a bureaucracy. Yep, check that one off. We're getting pretty close. We will have a government that exists to exercise power and control. Yep. And a government that is both God and nanny. Uh, re redistributing wealth until wealth ceases to exist. The thing about the welfare clause in the Constitution, promoting the general welfare does not mean stealing from half the people to give to the other half. That does not promote the general welfare. I'm sorry. Nobody should interpret it that way. So what would a constitutional republic look like? I'm not talking about cities and roads and highways and industries. I'm talking about the people, the citizens. All citizens would be taught to develop character and virtue from early childhood. I think that's missing from most American schools today, public ones anyway. All citizens would practice self-government by being moral, upright, honest, and decent. And government at all levels would adhere to the basic principles of behavior taught in Christianity. And I'm going to show you why that's so important. You've heard it from various sources. Well, I've got my own version. And all citizens act in good faith in all that they do. That was one of the keys to the debate on the Constitution. These men came from all sorts of diverse backgrounds. Some of them are slaveholders, some of them were not. Some were violently anti-slavery. They came together to do something, which was important, and they overcame their personal differences because they could see the greater principles and because they were men of principle, character, and conscious. And they acted in good faith one toward another. They had their differences, they had their disputes, they had their debates, but they came together and produced something which could not be produced today in the environment which we have. Okay. Um, Reed, if you would pass out the refrigerator magnets, please. I put, I put something together which, if you want additional copies, these come from Vistaprint, I can get them for you, but this is just a little magnet which I hope you will take home and put on your refrigerator. It says the Constitution Party, it's got liberty, integrity, and prosperity, it's got the email, it's got the website, but then it has something else right on the bottom that I I don't think it's original to me, but I think it's very important, and that is live worthy of American citizenship. We don't talk about this nearly enough. Being in this country is a privilege. It's a tremendous privilege. There's never been a country like this. We need to live, not just us as members of the Constitution Party, but all Americans need to live worthy of American citizenship. How do we do that? We do it by practicing self-government. We do it by exercising public and private virtue. We do it by being men and women of character. We do it by ensuring that the principles of liberty are passed on to our children and to our grandchildren. Okay, so where is the United States today? Well, government interference in the economy has introduced many elements of socialism into American life. Lobbying by both private corporations and government agencies has wrested significant influence away from American citizens. And if it sounds like I'm racing through this, I'm from New York, so I can do that. But I'm sorry about that. I have to. And the advance of progressivism has brought about significant and dangerous changes to our Constitution. We all know that. Let's move on. So what do we have today? We have elected officials and appointed judges who act in their own self-interest. They ignore their oath of office and they act upon their personal opinions as they seek power and wealth. And... You and, you and I and our children and grandchildren are taught dependence upon government. We're taught immorality, gender confusion, drug abuse, and that there is no God. Okay. This is unacceptable. Fortunately, it's also unsustainable. Okay, James Madison said, We are free today substantially, but the day will come when our republic will be an impossibility. It will be an impossibility because wealth will be concentra concentrated in the hands of a few. A republic cannot stand upon bandits, and when the day comes, when the wealth of the nation will be in the hands of a few, then we must rely upon the wisdom of the best elements in the country to readjust the laws of the nations to the changed conditions. Now, there's your argument for an Article 5 convention. Where are you going to find the best people, and how are you going to decide who they are? That's the problem. Do we have people like the founders today? They're, if they are, they're in hiding. They're very, very hard to find. <sighs> so, okay. 
Um, everybody's got a magnet now, good. So what happened? Let's go back a little bit, and I'm going to run out of time very quickly. I've got about another two hours, if that's all right, Frank. Um, <laughs> this is what I have learned through my research. America was deliberately infected with the disease of progressivism, beginning with the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt. Progressivism changed every aspect of American life, substituting an all-powerful government for initiative and freedom. And this is the biggest argument against progressivism, by the way. Religion, honor, integrity, decency, morality, good faith, dealing, and responsible citizenship were all sacrificed for, quote, the greater good. We're not treated as individuals anymore by our government. We're treated as part of the collective. So we have to sacrifice ourselves for the greater good, whatever that happens to be, or whatever the progressives determine it is. Okay. So why didn't we, as this was all taking place over a long period of time, why didn't we defend our values and principles? I'm thinking of the uh, sexual revolution. When I was in high school, I was in a class, graduating class of over 400. There was one girl in the class who was sexually active. She was shunned by everybody else. Today, it's the virgin in the class who's the one who's shunned by everybody else. Times have changed. Why didn't we defend our values and principles? One, we were lied to. Two, we didn't want to offend people who seemed passionate about their cause, whatever that was. Three, we failed to recognize the insidious nature of progressivism. Four, we tend to be easily bought off by empty promises. Okay, fifth, we were told that America was wealthy and that we had an obligation to help those less fortunate. That's, we're hearing that all over the place today. That's why we are encouraging illegals, all the El Salvadoran children who are being brought to this country so they can be anchor children to bring their parents in. We're being told that we have an obligation for the entire world to support the entire world's economy, to bring people up to our standards. I don't know where that is in the Constitution. I haven't found it yet. And then six, like the frog in a pan of water being heated on a stove, we adapted to the changes and never noticed until we passed the point of no return, which we passed a long time ago. I'd say about, oh, by 1933, we had passed the point of no return. Okay, we've talked about this book. Let's move on. What's progressivism about, all about? This is from Matthew Spaulding. Two basic things. If you learn nothing else at this whole meeting, well, I wouldn't, shouldn't say that, but this is really, really, really important. And this is why I went back and talked to Matthew Spaulding. First, progressives teach that there is no truth. There are no fixed truths, certainly no objective or unchanging standards. This is a quote from Matthew Spaulding. Certainly no objective or unchanging standards of right to guide politics. All truth claims are contingent, merely personal values relative to other equally valid claims. This is patently false. But this is what we've been taught, and this is what your children and grandchildren are being taught. And by the way, you can hope that your children are not, and grandchildren are not in the group of children, of many children, who go to school in the morning and they have to sign a statement promising that they will never tell their parents what they've been taught that day. It's happening all over the country. If there is no truth, there are no correct principles. If there is no truth, there is no God. So we talk about godless communism. This is why. It's all part of progressivism. Washington said this, we should not look back unless it is to derive useful lessons from past errors and for the purpose of profiting by dearly bought experience. He was right. We don't look back, we look to the future and to create a better and better society of better educated people, more righteous, more faithful, more God-fearing, more obedient, more kind, more compassionate. That's what he envisioned. The progressives say something different. They say that all ideas and their meaning and status are relative to their moment in time, which is to say that history has no lessons to teach us. And white men who wore, who wore funny wigs and owned slaves 200 and some years ago couldn't possibly teach us anything about how we should live today. This is progressivism. Two tenets. No truth. Set everything in its historical context. You have wiped out the entire history of mankind and all the benefits that we might derive by learning the lessons of history in two simple tenets. That's it. That's progressivism. All right. My book we've already talked about. We talked about that one too. You've got copies. So how did the plot work? In my book, uh, Will You Help Save Your Country? One thing I love about this is the photo section, about page 60-something. There it is. I had the privilege of placing Eleanor Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler next to each other because they are both progressives. And of the, which one did the greater damage to the human race? I, it's a toss-up. Eleanor Roosevelt, when the United Nations was founded as a memorial to her dead husband, Franklin D., uh, labored very diligently as a, some sort of official emissary to the United Nations. It took 1,400-plus votes in the General Assembly of the United Nations to pass her Turkey, which was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you may have heard me speak about this before. 
it's, it's in the book. You need to know about it. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration says that all, all people on this planet are entitled to free food, free housing, free clothing, free medical care, free transportation, free education, free uh, social services when needed, um, and free retirement benefits. So there you are. Uh, thank you. You do. Yes, indeed. So it was um, John Dewey and Horace Mann, two famous American names, who decided that it was up to them to wipe out the influence of family and religion in our public schools. They succeeded beyond their wildest imaginations. The plot included preaching the gospel of the collective rather than that of the individual. We talked about that. Make people feel guilty about living comfortable middle class lives while people in you fill in the blank are starving. And make people dependent upon the state. Okay. And finally, change the laws to enshrine human rights. That's, I'll tell you the story on that some other time because we're running out of time. So what happens? Today, progressives actively work to suppress religious faith. We are now, Christians are now on the defensive. If you have any religious beliefs, you are instantly a bigot now under the law. This is a complete change from when I was born. And it's, it's rather terrifying. They work to replace capitalism with totalitarianism and massive government, except for the elite. There's always going to be that elite. I was in Russia not too long ago, and uh, it was absolutely amazing to see how all this has unfolded. Remember, every, every citizen of, of Russia got shares in these once national, now privatized uh, institutions, the steel, the uh, aluminum, the electricity, all this sort of thing. You may not remember that, but it happened. Well, within months, all of those shares ended up in the hands of the oligarchs. So Russia is now, Putin presides over the, the biggest corporate magnets in, in the history of mankind. And the people suffer as a result. That's just, that's the way the country works. We're, they're always, every country is going to have their elite, no matter what economic system or government they may claim to have, because the elite are better than you and me. They're smarter than you. They deserve to be in power, and they deserve to benefit accordingly. So they do. The progressives promote immorality and dishonesty. They live lives of anger, dishonesty, deception, hypocrisy, cowardice, and immorality. This is their lives, which is why they never look happy. And they almost always act in bad faith, because their mantra is the end justifies the means. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, for example, um, what are we seeing them do today? They're resisting voter ID enforcement everywhere. And we heard something about that from Joe Miller last night. They're encouraging illegals to enter the U.S. and to vote illegally, of course. They don't even want to call them illegals. They're changing the, the definitions there, what they're called. They have redefined religious belief as bigotry and superstition. They, they've made a shift in many states. I was talking to Frank about this. Many states now select candidates through petition drives instead of conventions. That's basically unconstitutional. They promote sexual deviance in the public schools and many other such venues. And they perform defamation and character assassination of famous Americans, and they do things like revisionist history. Got to be really, really careful about the textbooks. The famous case in Texas was the American history textbook used in the high, school, high schools all over the state, and it was adopted all over the country, which devoted four pages to Marilyn Monroe and one paragraph to the founding of America. And that was the textbook for all the public schools. So that's what we're seeing. And they lower, they're trying now to lower the voting age to 16 and 17 year olds. Okay. Okay. All right. So isn't that their right to do it? Isn't this America? Don't we have a First Amendment? Can't you say what you want? Well, first of all, we tend to be defenseless against contrary theories of government because we're not educated in the principles of freedom and liberty. They've already accomplished that step. They've swept away education on truth and they've substituted their stuff. And if you promulgate other philosophies that will change your constitution or eliminate it altogether, that's, that's very dangerous. That's going to change our country completely. And it might be called sedition. And in fact, it has. We have the Alien and Sedition Act in the late 1700s. We have the um, Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, I believe it was in 19... Woodrow Wilson's administration, I don't remember the year, where free speech was abridged. Abraham Lincoln did the same thing. He threw a U.S. congressman into prison for speaking out against him. Where do we draw the line in there? Is it is there a line that we should draw? Well, if we would properly defend our freedoms, if we were properly educated, and if we, didn't, if we had the blessings and the importance of liberty instilled in us, we could stand up to these false philosophies. But we haven't been, so we can't. So when does freedom of speech not apply? 
It's a broad question. I'm not even going to try to answer it. All right, so what would you call a deliberate, premeditated, well-thought-out, and well-funded long-term plan to undermine natural rights in our Constitution? What would you call it? I call it sedition. But we can't punish it that way. All right, another example. Um, some of you have heard this story. The progressives win and win and win and win and win. They have never lost. Here's one example. When I was living in New Hampshire several years ago, the New Hampshire state legislature was, legislature was debating um, a gay rights act, which was going to be imposed upon the entire state. So they allowed public testimony in one side or the other. So I was there giving my public testimony. We were restricted to three minutes. They cut me off at one minute, 15 seconds, because they didn't like what I was saying. But they gave the gay bishop and the um, lead attorney for the gay rights movement an hour each. And this love ate up what they had to say. What I learned from that day was what the gay rights lawyer had to say. He said, homosexuals do not want equal treatment. We are better than you. We demand and we will get preferential treatment all across the land. So I got so intrigued by that that I went to a gay rights organizational meeting. Uh, <clears throat> I'd already gotten my picture in the paper sitting next to the gay bishop. That was bad enough. So what the heck? I'll go to a meeting. So I did, and I picked this magazine up. You've got to, uh, would you distribute those, please? It's called Docket. I, there's a 16-page insert in the center of this particular magazine, and it's called Docket. Here's why the progressives win all the time. These 16 pages detail every fight the gay rights movement was fighting at the time. So they're talking about Baker versus, well, they, did, they had just won Baker versus Vermont. Um, they had just won in the matter of the visitation of Troxel before the U.S. Supreme Court. But they were still fighting in uh, Barnett versus U.S. Airways and so on. They, they laid out exactly where they were fighting, what court they were dealing with, or what legislature, or whatever it happened to be. They detailed who were going to be the lead people in getting what they wanted passed. They detailed how many demonstrations were going to be held, where they were going to be held, when they were going to be held, how many people were going to be participating, how much money they were going to spend on each of these protests and other events, and where they were going to get the money from. And then finally, if that particular incident, that particular effort failed, they had the go around, the work around to get it done the next time. We have never done this. You've already got those, Frank. It's right in front of you. Can the Constitution Party be this well organized? Well, the first thing we've got to do is to figure out what we want to do. And because we are a decentralized party, it's much more difficult because we have 50 different states with 50 different needs. But still, we have to come up with a strategy like this and we have to apply it religiously, literally. That's, how we, that's the only way we're going to do that. So here's the question I ask in all my presentations. Name just one thing the conservative movement has accomplished. This is why I don't like the word conservative. Name one thing the conservative movement has accomplished in the past century to reverse any item on the progressive agenda. You can't. It's never happened. They have won every single time. It's pretty frightening. But they have won. We've got to stop that. And there are now people who are beginning to wake up and say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. And boy, if you didn't get scared by what Joe Miller said last night, you were sleeping through his presentation. All right, here's something we've all seen. John Adams. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. But, but, can we impose the need for character development and religious faith and self-government upon the people of the United States? And the answer is no. We cannot. If Americans do not love liberty, they will not live worthy of citizenship, but they also will not support the blessings of liberty. And that's what we're faced with. And we always have been. We've never fixed that problem. I'm going to skip the Ronald Reagan quote. So what about fixed truths? I'm going to, I don't know how much time you're going to give me, Frank, but I'm going to try to finish up. Going back to what Matthew Spaulding said about the progressives do not believe that there are any fixed truths. All right. We understand it differently. True principles like natural rights come from God. If we claim there is no God, we have no natural rights or true principles. Anything goes, which is kind of the world that we live in today. If we have no principles, we are subject to the rule and whim of the majority. There is no basis for government or for society. We lose the rule of law. We lose the body of law. We lose the reason for obedience to law. And we've become basically a democracy, which is why democracies never work. 
Thoreau said this, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Well, we're the one, and there's the thousand out there who are don't even know what the problem is. Watch this, how to fix it. All right, another important book, which I'm still working on. Everything on my recommended reading list, I have already read at least once. This one I haven't finished yet. It's fascinating. This is from 1997, The End of Democracy. It's the uh, first things debate, which you may be familiar with. I, I'm sure some of you are. This one says basically all that we are trying to do as the Constitution Party is a waste of time. Why? Because the primary problem in the United States has been judicial activism, and there's not a thing we can do to change it. Because even if we replace the members one by one with Scalia's and people like that, it's not going to have enough of an effect in time. And they're not going to reverse themselves on so many issues where they have been so wrong for so very long. It's just not going to happen. I choose to be a lot more optimistic than that, but that's what this book says. And it's very well worth reading. Um, Noah Webster, we don't hear from him very often, said that if the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, <clears throat> like the uh, tweeter-in-chief, the government will soon be corrupted. If a Republican government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness, it must be because the citizens neglect the divine commands and elect bad men to make and administer the laws. Well, he's absolutely right, but so what do we do about it? Okay. So when do we get to choose? The progressives knew that Americans were largely honest, upright, and moral people from the time of the founding until about the early 1900s when everything started to fall apart. And we had the worst year in American history, which was which year? Getting close. You're all around at 1913. Why? What happened in 1913? 16th Amendment, 17th Amendment, direct election to senators, and Federal Reserve. Thank you. Worst of year in American history. If we had chosen then before... 1913, we would have chosen as a nation the Constitution, for the most part. By slowly eating away at our moral foundation, progressives have made us far more likely to turn to the welfare state and to dependence upon government. Have you seen this, the map, the electoral map of the 2016 election? 40% of registered voters didn't show up, which is more voters than either major candidate got for president. 2016, Hillary versus Trump. 40% of the voters stayed home. <laughs> they are our people on both sides. As Dustin was saying before, these are the people that we want to talk to. Those, In a previous issue of my newsletter, just before the election, I put out two, de two dreadful choices. And I talked about a little bit about both candidates and why we couldn't elect either one of them. Anyway, so they made us far more likely to turn to the welfare state. Oh, the millennials. Um, Bernie Sanders, when he was still in the race, what was it, 85% of millennials voted for Bernie Sanders? They wanted socialism. And if, if you ask them, they'll say socialism is superior to capitalism today. That's uh, a, the product of progressive education. Okay. So what do we have to do? And I'm going to, if you think I've been racing before, I'm really racing now. We have to restore the voice of morality in the public domain. My work at this point is going to be to get on Christian uh, radio stations and try to spread the gospel of freedom and liberty and so on. Um, personally, I would like to speak in every church in the United States. If you have connections with a church you would like to bring in a speaker, I promise I will not embarrass you, but I would really like to do that. But if I can do it over the radio or TV, that will work just as well. Um, we need to work for the repeal of the Johnson Amendment. I'm not going to talk about that today. We need to encourage President Trump to eliminate the Department of Education. Government has no business being involved in public education. And you... Forget the school board, it's the curriculum committee. The school board talks about money. It's the curriculum committee that determines what textbooks are used and what the teachers say. So that's really important. All right, I'm going to skip this. We haven't got time. So what do we have to do? We have to make truth our standard. We have to become responsible citizens. We have to stand up for what is right by what we know is right and what God tells us is right. We have to exercise faith in God. We have to live our religion. We have to engage in public discussions about eternal principles. And we have to set a good example for all Americans and encourage them. One of my favorite victories is with a good friend of mine who's a libertarian. He chops down trees for me every once in a while. And he was happy to be a libertarian until I told him that libertarians believe in that whatever doesn't harm somebody else is fine. And I said, what about abortion and drug abuse? And he said, you know, you're right. I think moral values are really important now that he's got their firstborn child. That's kind of changed his thinking a little bit. He's leaning much more toward us than he is toward the libertarians. 
we have to bring our public schools under local control. Do you know how much that's going to cost? For most public school districts in the United States to free themselves from the federal government, they would have to increase their ta property taxes less than 3%. Because about 5% of the money they get, it's the tail that wags the dog. It comes from the federal government. The rest comes from property taxes and other s local funding. So if they want to get a, get a, away from standards of learning and all the horrible things being shoved down their throats by the Department of Education, find a way. Do bake sales. Do something. Get the community involved in getting the government out of their local schools. Demand the abolition of standards of learning. Engage all parents and grandparents in the proper education of their children and grandchildren. I'll be happy to talk to you about this afterward because I know we don't want to get too far behind schedule here. But this is really important. I have a good friend who does this. He's got four young children. Every semester, he spends a half a day in class with each of the children separately, one day at a time. And then after school, it's the afternoon. And in the afternoon, it's their day with dad. So they get to talk about what they learned in school. So he is a very good observer of what's going on in the classroom. Not only that, but he is well liked. He got permission to get in first. And in one case, when a child moved from elementary school to middle school, he went to the principal of the middle school and he said, I'm going to be visiting your classrooms. And the principal said, no, you're not. It's not our policy. And he said, you've got to change your policy. I'm a taxpayer. They changed the policy. You can do this. And your children deserve it. But he's also learning what they're teaching that they shouldn't be. And, and he's getting ideas like that. He goes on field trips. They love him because he's a free chaperone. It's, it's working out very well. But we also need to stop robbing our children of their childhood. What do I mean by that? Public schools now teach sex education as early as kindergarten. Gender identity is a major topic right from the first day of school, which causes great confusion, as you imagine. Joe Miller said something about it last night. If you want to stay in the closet and promote your agenda to yourself and your buddies, that's fine. But when you bring it into my schools to my children, I'm sorry. I'm not going to let that happen. That cannot stand. And it does happen. We've seen it all over the country. Value-neutral instruction denies God. So why do they promote Islam? I don't know. Teaching drug abuse, condom use, the beauty of Islam not only robs children of their childhood, it robs them of their chance for happy, productive lives and stable marriages. It does. This is very serious. So why do we tolerate public schools that prohibit Bibles from the classroom yet promote Islam as superior to Christianity? This is a thought question. Here's another one. Why do we permit public schools to graduate functional illiterates? illiterates? My wife is a mathematics professor at Southern Virginia University. And when she was first there 10 years ago, she was astounded when she saw one student, a freshman, who'd never been taught the multiplication tables. Now it's a commonplace. None of them have been taught. Now they haven't been taught the associative principle. A plus B equals B plus A. Schools don't teach that anymore. They don't teach cursive writing. They don't teach science. And some universities all over the country now are deciding that mathematics is no longer important unless you're going to go into a field requiring mathematics. So they are eliminating their departments of mathematics. Where do you think you get the people who find out that they're good at mathematics? Those who have a core program in their first two years of college in mathematics. You eliminate that and you just... <laughs> the ten top fields of employment in the United States today all require a significant amount of mathematics. So, go figure. All right. So what can we expect? If we fail to educate our children in the principles of morality, integrity, freedom, and responsible citizenship, if instead we teach them to depend on the state, if they are thoroughly indoctrinated in sex, drug abuse, and living for themselves and for today, the results are inevitable and devastating, and we are seeing them now in spades. Okay, so what will you do? Will you take responsibility for the education? And I'm not only asking you to do this in addition to everything else you do for your family and for the Constitution Party and all the other things you do. Will you take responsibility for the education of your children and grandchildren? We've got to do it because nobody else will. Nobody else is as concerned about your children and grandchildren than you are. Will you work to ensure the true and correct principles are adhered to in every institution you support with your taxes? Will you defend your faith in God by both example and activism? So, next question. Can we and will we live as responsible citizens? Will we be self-governing? Will we increase our obedience to God's commands? And will we always act with integrity and good faith? We cannot lower ourselves to the level of the progressives. They beat us up with our own weapons. I understand that with our own tools, but we have to stand on the higher moral ground no matter what. Okay, sorry about that. It makes it, it puts us at a significant disadvantage in some respects. But for those of you who know what it's like to receive an answer to prayer, it gives us a great advantage. 
Will we live worthy of our Constitution? What else haven't we passed out yet that we should have? What, is, what have you got? Oh, the Ben Franklin quote, please. Let's finish with that since I've, I've got about 30 more slides, but we're just, we're just about done. Going to give you a quote which I would love to attribute to Benjamin Franklin, but can't because he probably didn't say it, but I sure wish he had. That's just for people who didn't already get a copy, so that's fine. Um, I wish I had it in front of me. I'd like to have somebody read it. Let me move a little bit farther until everybody's got a copy. All right. Finally, in closing, can we make a case for truth? as a portion of what we do as responsible citizens. I believe we can. First of all, let's build the case. Natural rights are the basis of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is the foundation of the Constitution. There is a clear link between government established by the Constitution and dependence upon true principles. For example, John Locke wrote the famous two treatises on government published in 1689. He refers to the Bible more than 1,500 times to demonstrate the proper operation of civil government. Nothing wrong with that. It's just that we don't use the Bible anymore. We don't believe in it. All right, who's got the Benjamin Franklin quote who would like to read it to us? Read, go ahead. Stand up, read it loud, or stand by the microphone if you would, please. I love this quote. Okay, you got it. When you get into a tight place and everything goes against you till it seems as though you could not hold on a minute longer, never give up then. For that is just the place and the time that the tide will turn. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. The faithful see the invisible, believe the incredible, and then receive the impossible. Thank you. I think that's wonderful. It's also been attributed to, attributed to Harriet Beecher Stowe, so I really hope Ben Franklin said it first. All right. In the writings of the Founding Fathers, somebody did a 10-year study, an analysis of 15,000 documents written by the Founding Fathers, and it revealed that of the 3,154 quotations in their writings, 34% um, of them were from the Bible, which is four times as many as the next cited source. Then we have ben, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, who, though he violated the First Amendment and put congressmen into prison, he said, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. And then we have the US, U.S. Supreme Court, the uh, 1892, and the U.S. Supreme Court, Holy Trinity Church versus U.S. decision. These and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. It's one source, there are others. So what is the link? All right, the Founding Fathers always intended for us to be self-governing. That's what's always missing from the history books. And I wish it was not. The sole purpose of government was and should be to defend American freedom. Self-governing people have no need of laws, for their integrity stems from their adherence to correct principles. Now, there are some exceptions to that which I don't have time to go into. So, does truth exist? How many people here have talked about prayer so far in this meeting? I know all of you are, you believe in God. Here's something I use frequently. Well, not as frequently as I would like to, but I'm talking to people who don't believe in God or profess to be atheists because they're all around us. Just because you have not had an experience with the Spirit of the Lord or have refuse to acknowledge it as such, does not mean that I haven't. So are you willing to violate my rights because of something that you simply have not had happen to you or which you have chosen to ignore? And is that fair to me? And do you believe that we should be treated equally? You've got a conflict there that you need to deal with. So, all right. All right, we've passed everything out. If you have not had such an experience, what's stopping you? Frank, you want me to quit? I'll quit. Oh, five more minutes. All right. Let me tell you my story. When I was 11, this is more than 50 years ago, I had a serious illness that um, it was an infection that traveled around my body and settled in my left hip and dissolved the hip joint. And I was hospitalized, couldn't walk. Um, and they brought in, my parents found one doctor after another, specialist and such, and nobody had any idea what the problem was. Finally, they found a man who had actually diagnosed a similar condition for Arthur Godfrey. Anybody remember him? Yeah, okay. And, uh, so he diagnosed it, he operated, and he said after the operation, if we had waited five more days, I would never have walked again. 
So after that, I was, I was young enough that my hip could regrow. It was, it was a great blessing to me. So six months later, after I had been in bed for that long period of time, my parents hired a tutor, former principal of our elementary school, to come in and teach me. It was, I had great parents. Uh, I was in my neighborhood walking with my younger brother, who was six, on a Saturday morning, the only time in our lives that we ever walked together anywhere on a Saturday morning. I have no idea where we were going or what we had in mind or why we were there, but we had a purpose, and we didn't know it, but we found out. As we, we lived in a beautiful park, at least it had been beautiful until I-95 split it right down the middle and was 12 lanes wide, and I watched one traffic accident per day for about the first 10 years. It was amazing. Anyway, it had been a beautiful neighborhood, so I was walking around a curve, and we came up to the house of one of my classmates, and I looked at the house, and there was smoke coming out of the chimney, and I looked away and looked at my brother, and we continued our conversation, and then something said to me, look again. So I did. I looked, and the smoke was not coming out of the chimney. The house was on fire. It was still early in the morning. So I, we had just passed the call box of the fire department, so I told my brother, he was barely tall enough to reach it, to pull down the handle, pull the lever, and call the fire department. Well, I ran to the house to get everybody out. There were two parents and the two daughters at home. They were all still asleep. So I pounded on the door. Somebody came to the door, I think it was the wife, told her the house is on fire, please get everybody out now. And we did, pretty much in their night clothes, just before the house was engulfed in flames. And then the fire department didn't come. I couldn't figure out why until I realized, it, it, just, it occurred to me, it just, I had this thought that your neighborhood's been divided in half. The fire department probably went to the wrong side. So there were a whole bunch of us at this time. We ran to a place where we were right opposite the freeway, and we could look across, and sure enough, there's the fire department on the wrong side. So we made all the noise we could, and we got them to come out and put the fire out, but the house was basically destroyed. I had no particular, I mean, I was 11. What do you know when you're 11 or 12, actually? What do you know when you're 12 years old? Not much. I didn't have much of a religious background, but I knew from that day that there was some power that was watching over us because I believed I helped to save four lives that day. We can use that. I believe there's not a person in this room who hasn't had an experience of some sort like that, an experience with the Spirit of the Lord. That's our foundation. That's what we rely on. This is what we teach. This is what we share. It is our right. It is our privilege. Whether we consider that we live in a Christian nation or not, we know the truth exists. And it's our obligation to share it with others. Thank you for listening.